to episode 230 of the Various Sundry Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio on the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is very excited to talk more about the English Reformation, John Scott Sloat. I'm a typical American tabloid kind of guy, and uh, the English Reformation is nothing if not tabloid. Yeah, yeah. We as as we will well see today. That's for sure. Uh, Two hundred thirty episodes. Yeah. I feel the need to comment on the number of episodes we do, like every ten. Yeah. How many do you think we're going to do? <laughs> I don't. Do we get to five hundred? Gosh, John, I don't know. That'd be ten years. Yeah, I mean. Ten years is a long time. It'd be short. Well, it'd be just it'd be short of that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just short. Just yeah. short. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. That's a lot of content. That is a lot of content. Yeah. Yeah. I. I mean, all good things must come to an end mm-hmm. in this world. But not today. Not today. No. 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 no, no. The podcast will 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 continue. It will survive. Uh, so yes, this is uh, episode two thirty, but <clears throat> we're recording it. What's today? Seventeenth of May. Yeah, this will this will drop on the twenty eighth. But uh, yeah, so we were recording this what fifteen minutes after we were finished recording. Well, we were in the we were in the hallway talking about Scotty Scheffler. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and him getting arrested, the yeah. mug shop, and and it sounds like the PGA has now delayed the start. They got him back. Yeah, you know, they delayed the start of the, of the of the of the round, but he he's been released, and I think he is going to make his tea time. Wow. So. Wow. Anyway, which by the time this drops, all of this will be probably irrelevant except for the legal action that the PGA and the Louisville police uh, will be inevitably engaged in because oh yeah, it's a weird situation. All right. Uh, if you would like to contact the show and ask personal questions of John about the English Reformation, you can <laughs> – Find him on Twitter. Find us on Twitter, actually, at VNS Pod. Yeah. You can email the show at various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and YouTube, and we would love for you to leave a five star rating on whatever platform you access the show. All right, John, um, let's, uh, since we're recording so far in advance, we really don't have a sports segment to speak of here. Just a Scotty Shuffler. I mean, by now, uh, would the NBA NBA finals maybe have been set? I think maybe not. Like the conference championships would be still maybe in. Yeah, the I play. think the conference championships will be going on. Of course, we don't know this. who's in those at this point. So, Knicks are up case. three two. Well, now I mean they're so injured. I don't know that they can pull it out. You yeah. know, they're so. Uh, if they get OG back, I think they have a pretty good shot of making the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah. Did the Cavs? Are the Cavs? Out? They're done. They're done. Yep. Okay, so it's Boston against either the Knicks or the Pacers. Yep. And then, um, yeah, in the West, I mean, there's a weird – the whole Timberwolves-Nuggets series has been weird. Yeah. Like the, the Timberwolves blew out the Nuggets the first two games in Denver. Mm-hmm. And then the Nuggets won three straight to go up two, yeah. three, two. And then the Timberwolves won game six by like a million. Uh <laughs> They're up around. They were up by like fifty at one point, like right around that. So, it's, so who knows what's going to happen with that? Anyway. Yeah. All right. So instead, let's just jump right to our summer read. Okay. And we are continuing our journey through uh, Patrick Schreiner's book, "The Transfiguration of Christ: An Exegetical and Theological Reading." Slowing the pace down a little bit now. We've got uh, a little bit more space to talk here. Uh, chapter three, what he refers to as the glorious signs. And so um, he uh, he's going to walk through different aspects of what happens on the mountain in terms of um, God's, uh, you know, the Jesus shining face and the white clothes, as well as um, – you know, just light in general and its biblical significance. A um, lot, lot of discussion on light in this. A lot of discussion. Uh, and as, well as, as well as the significance of the cloud. Uh, and then he includes the voice here, doesn't he? 
think. Um, well, he talks about presence of Moses and Elijah. Um, and then, oh, where is that? I thought I talked about the voice in here. Maybe he did. Maybe that's the next. That might be the next, next. chapter. Yeah, because the, I believe yep. the next one is Glorious Sand. There you go. That, there that you go. With yep. voice. Okay. So um, to start this chapter, and this is honestly part of what makes this book unique. Um, I mean, we mentioned in our last episode how uh, Schreiner tries to bring together both the worlds of systematic theology and biblical theology, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I'm guessing for many of our listeners, they may not even necessarily know uh, or be aware of how uh, how often those things in the academy are kind of sectioned off. Mm-hmm. That you either do biblical theology or you do systematic theology, but you don't tend to do both necessarily. Yeah. And that's unfortunate because they uh, both are necessary. Yeah. Both are uh, necessary and helpful to the life of the church. Yeah. And so even though some might focus more on one than the other, for example, I mean, I, I do very little academic uh, systematic theology, but. Or dogmatic theology. Yeah. Some people call it. Um, but I do a lot of biblical theology. So anyway, so he talks about this Trinitarian grammar. Um, and I'll try to summarize this. Uh, he basically said – this is on page 56. Um, he says, to understand the brilliance of the transfiguration, we need a Trinitarian grammar for the transfiguration has a Trinitarian texture. Below, I will examine, one, how God is light in himself, and two, how God's light shines forth through the Son and Spirit. So that's his starting point um, in terms of of what he's trying to accomplish. And then uh, launches into a long section on um, God as light and Obviously, he deals a lot with just um, – I mean, plenty of texts make this connection, but he gets a little bit into the into the depths here uh, in terms of God as light in himself. Mm-hmm. And his point is he says, God doesn't possess, receive, or reflect light. To say God is light is to affirm an inner luminosity – Good word. I, he uses the word luminosity a lot, yeah, and I love it. In God, with no reference to his creation or creative acts, the radiance of his being is found in his essence. This affirmation that God is light in himself leads to uh, a number of important distinctions that he goes on to note, um, which uh, that's an interesting distinction. I think one that's actually helpful is – the idea that God is light in himself, that he's always been light, that light in this sense is not something that's created. It's something that's intrinsic to his being. Um, and that, of course, is going to tie into, in the transfiguration, the fact that uh, Jesus' face is transformed, transfigured mm-hmm. into uh, bright light. Uh, you know, it goes on to talk about how it's brighter than um, his clothes, clothing is whiter than any launderer can can comp- can basically produce, and his face is essentially brighter than the sun. I I think, and this is moving ahead, but on page seventy, he talks about the differences between Moses and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right, Moses going up on the mountain, Jesus going up on the mountain, Moses seeing the back of God and his sh- mm-hmm. his face shining. Um, he says on uh, page 70, while Moses' bright face was a reflection, Jesus' brightness emanates from his being. Jesus' face is the sun. Moses' is the moon. And I thought that was really – that was yeah. that was that was really good and helpful. Yeah, that, that analogy of, of sun and moon is helpful. Obviously, the sun possesses light in and of itself. Mm-hmm. The moon merely reflects what the sun uh, shines. So, um, yeah, I think – and, and really, that's even getting at um, in the aftermath of the of the golden calf incident, where Moses goes up onto the mountain to intercede. Mm-hmm. He comes back down; his face is shining. 
uh, the people can't bear it. And so, um, yeah, it's it, it is striking. Um, I think this is part of what makes what Schreiner does here so helpful is to, to when you think about the transfiguration in, in in the context of the number of places where throughout Scripture. God says, you can't see my face. Mm -hmm. Like no man can see my face and live. Uh, and even when Moses asks, as you mentioned, to see his glory, um, God says, I'll show you my backside as I mm -hmm. pass by Yeah, because you can't see my face and live. And now here you have um, not just the, disciple, uh, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, but you have Moses there. Like Moses finally gets his wish, so to speak, that he didn't get in his lifetime, but he gets to see the face of God in Jesus Christ uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so um, – and that, of course, ties into um, a lot of different biblical theological threads there. But that, that that's stood out to me even just in reflecting on the – Transfiguration here through this. Um, what else caught your attention here in uh, in this chapter? So uh, after the grammar, he really works through three sorts of things, three mm -hmm. uh, topics. Jesus' luminosity, which again, love the word luminosity. There you go. Uh, the cloud, the bright cloud, mm -hmm. and Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Um, I thought the cloud stuff was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I thought identifying that with the Holy Spirit, and yeah. at first I was a little skeptical yeah. of, of that. But when you go back and you take it to, you know, the Exodus, right, mm -hmm. and the cloud leading them, the cloud descending on the tabernacle to speak to Moses, th those ideas, I went, okay, I can, I can see this. This is making sense to me. Yeah. Um, did you have any any thoughts on the clowns before? I, I think the Moses and Elijah stuff is really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I think it is easy to read <clears throat> the Transfiguration, and then you see Schreiner's claim about it being Trinitarian, and it might catch you off guard at first. You're like, wait a minute, I get that the baptism is Trinitarian. Yep. Father, Son, and then Spirit descending like a dove. Yep. Obvious. Well, here you have the Transfiguration. You might go, where is the spirit? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think he makes a good case for associating the spirit with the cloud that mm -hmm. that uh, was God's presence with his people in the wilderness. So, yeah, I think that's I think that's good. Um, I also going back to the first one, Jesus luminosity. Uh, he says on 64, and I really enjoyed this. The transfiguration <coughs> is the new burning bush moment. Uh, the yeah. burning fire that once appeared to Moses now pulses from Jesus's being. Hmm. I, I I think there's something to that. I, yeah, that that Jesus is his own theophany. <laughs> yeah, for sure, um, for sure. Um, and of course, I mean the the whole idea of of the 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 cloud as well. I think harkens back not only to um, the uh, the Exodus, but even when you look at Daniel seven and uh, the Son of Man. Uh, appearing with uh, basically coming on the clouds, I think is – I forget the exact verbiage there. Uh, another text that is prominent throughout the gospel accounts mm -hmm. in terms of um, Jesus' identity. So yeah, I think um, I think that's really helpful. But we should probably jump over to uh, Moses and Elijah because he spends a good bit of time talking about yeah, yeah. What did you think of the framework of seeing them as covenantal figures and individual figures? H has has that framework crossed your mind before? No, it hadn't mine either. I I actually think it's pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he takes something of a both and approach. Yeah, um, which which I find really, really really helpful. I think I had always been a covenantal guy. I would have always seen these as like, well, as best I could tell. Moses uh, represents uh, the law, mm -hmm. and and Elijah represents the prophets. They both have weird deaths too. He gets mm -hmm. into that a bit, and that's why they're both here. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I have always understood that largely as representing the law and the prophets. Um, and um, the fact that um, there are even clear parallels in Elijah's life back to Moses invites you to see Elijah in a Moses-like yeah. capacity. Um, and the fact that at the end of Malachi, you know, God promises to send Elijah before the great <clears throat> and terrifying day of the Lord. So, yeah, I think all those things come into play. Um, so I think, yeah, thinking about covenantal as well as – though I think what I struggle with, with that term covenantal is the fact that obviously Moses is directly associated with the Sinai covenant. Sure. Elijah is not – directly specifically associated with the giving of a covenant. He's a prophet who is a covenant messenger. Right. He's sort of prosecuting the violation of the yeah. covenant. Yeah. yeah. So um so w- one thing one thing in this section that that comes up is he talks a lot about Moses wanting to see God. Mhm. And one reflection I had, and, and maybe they get into, and I, I had the thought maybe they get into this in the next chapter, or uh, Patrick gets into this in the next chapter, and maybe you could tell me because I, I have not read it. But I was, I thought of the story of Elijah being in uh, secluded and uh, trying to hear the voice of God, mm-hmm. um, and you know it wasn't in the loud thunder or anything like that, but it was in, in sort of the quiet wind. Mm-hmm. Um, that seemed to me to be a natural connection to, Mo, to to Elijah in this story with with God's you know sort of speaking and mm-hmm. and uh, coming up. Does that come up in the next chapter? That that felt like a pretty natural connection to me. I don't remember if it did, to be honest. Okay, because I read this a little while ago, and so then I, I've only skimmed back through the chapters that we're going to discuss. So I, it, it could, um, but uh, yeah, it is. It is fascinating. And I think, you know, another connection there is, uh, and, and Luke is the one that makes this most evident, um, is that the two of them are talking about his exodus yeah. That, yeah. that Jesus is about to fulfill. Um, I, I try to be careful about criticizing English translations because I don't want people to think they're unreliable because they are reliable. They're, they're, yeah. We have numerous ones. But almost all of our English translations do us a disservice mm-hmm. in that in that passage in Luke nine by translating it something like they were talking about Jesus' departure, which he was which was about to happen in Jerusalem or something. Like, oh my gosh, did you just gut that of so much significance? <laughs> Rather than just translating, they were talking about his exodus, which he was about to fulfill. In Jerusalem, you're, you're just blinding the English reader from the massive significance of this is the one who is accomplishing the second exodus. Yeah, that you know he's a he's a he's the fulfillment of both Moses as the one who led the original exodus, and then even the the, the prophet greater than Moses. Uh, and so it's just it's disappointing that our English translations. Most of them will throw a footnote down there, but still. Uh, do you remember that I wrote my uh, <coughs> my New Testament research project for you when I was in seminary on the Transfiguration in Luke? Did you remember that? No. Yeah, that's what I wrote my New Testament. It clearly was memorable. But, so uh, the New Testament theology paper? No, no. I did two for you. So I did one that was readings in theology, and I did one on oh, the Exodus and all right. of Scripture. And then in— and then, in, and then I did uh, uh, zeroed in on mm-hmm. Luke's transfiguration passage. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't remember that. That's okay. That's okay. It was more than 10 years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. All right. So anything else here in this chapter before we, before we move I don't think forward so. here? I, I really enjoyed this chapter. Um Really enjoyed this. I just appreciate Patrick has an ability to um, to think through texts from a wide variety of angles. Yeah, and that brings out um, a number of different, I think, helpful insights uh, when he does that. So I think there's a lot here for uh, for our podcast listeners to to glean 
Yeah. And and I will stress, um, I think this is very readable. I, this is not a like, well, only someone who's seminary educated can read this. I think I think a I think a non seminary educated person can absolutely read this. Now yeah. they're not gonna get everything, but there's still so much that you're going to get that you know, it's it's worth there there's a value in reading books where you're like, I'm gonna get sixty five percent of this. Mm-hmm. There's a value in that. Yeah. Great, you got sixty five percent. Don't get hung up on the thirty five percent that just went past you or went over your head or just didn't connect. Yeah. That's fine. Like I think sometimes readers get too caught up in well, there's gonna be stuff in there I can't understand. So Yeah. Um get what you can. The other thing I'd say about his writing and I don't think this is I think that this it's to this book specifically is the number of church fathers. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, he he is doing some serious work with the church fathers. Yes. So that, yeah, way more than uh, contemporary scholars, which is part of what makes uh, it refreshing in some ways. Is because yeah. people are going to read through this and be exposed to different church fathers, and uh, even if they don't always necessarily fully agree with everything that they see in a church father, they're gonna they're gonna benefit from it. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. All right, John, let's move on to something not really related, only in the loosest sense, I suppose, <laughs> to part two of our discussion of the English Reformation. All right. So last time we sort of zeroed in on the setting. Yep. Uh, sort of like uh, kind of going right along with Patrick Schreiner's work, right? In that, yep. in that first week, we did the setting of the English Reformation. We talked about a variety of of things happening in Europe, a variety of things happening specifically in England, the fact that King Henry VII takes the throne and has an incredibly weak throne and is in desperate need of male heirs. Yes. Something that he will pass on to his male heirs. Um, yeah. Trying but, to establish his own dynasty. Yes. Yes. And uh, maybe we didn't point this out last time. England is incredibly Catholic during this time. Yes. Very, very Catholic. Uh a very educated Catholic group, the priest in England, had more uh, education than most throughout Europe. And I think that has to do with England's education, uh, you know, historic universities there. Yep. But, uh, yeah, let's let's dive in. We're, we're going to do all six wives of Henry VIII. Wow. And uh, This I'm is really, the National Enquirer version of uh, the very A little bit. We'll, we'll get into some details. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, Henry VII uh, has, uh, for all purposes here, we'll just say two sons. Uh, And this is not the start to a parable. (laughs) Uh, He has the oldest son, Arthur, and Henry VIII. Okay. So Arthur, being the oldest, has the ultimate claim to the throne. All right. And so Henry VII finds for him a wife, uh, Catherine of Aragon, and she is Spanish. Uh, she is the daughter of Philip and Isabella. Uh, and, king and, of Spain. King of Spain. And th- by the way, those are the people that sent Columbus uh, in 1492 across go. the ocean blue, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, th- this is where this is all happening. Mm-hmm. And so she comes up. Young, I mean, I mean, sixteen years old, mm-hmm. uh, to a country where she doesn't speak the language. Uh, yeah, she speaks Spanish, uh, and when she gets there, King Henry the Seventh's wife tell her, "Yeah, don't learn, don't learn English, learn French. Just <laughs> skip it." Um, and she's married to Arthur. Yeah, immediately. Yep. Uh, then thinks they're married for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arthur, there's a famous little little story where Arthur uh, comes out of his bedchamber the next morning and going like, "I visited Spain last night," and you know, you know, it's like <laughs> this, it's just bragging a little bit. Um, however, uh, Arthur dies, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, like, what on earth do you do with Catherine? Yeah. Uh, Henry's probably too young at this point to be married. 
it's against the law to marry your brother's wife in England and throughout Europe, really, mm-hmm. and that's part of uh, part of Catholic law at this time. Yep. And uh, so they they kind of go through this rigmarole and basically say that the Pope gives them a special dispensation, says, "Listen, Catherine's so young, uh, we're we're going to annul that marriage, and yep. you can marry Henry." Mm-hmm. And so Catherine marries Henry, and uh, and the and the Pope has to speak into this now. At the same breath, you have to realize Catherine's a very important person throughout Europe. Uh, the Spanish throne is a very important throne mm-hmm. in Europe. And Catherine's uncle, cousin, is the Holy Roman Emperor at this time All right. as well. So so just keep that in the background. Uh, so Catherine and Henry are married. They, they, they begin start – they try to have children. Uh, they have a number of miscarriages. Uh, and produce one daughter yep. uh, named uh, named Mary, Mary Tudor. Uh, and uh, this is seen as a sign of a curse on them. Mm-hmm. The people of England are going like, gee golly willikers. You know, this is – In that is, exact term, in gee that exact golly term. willikers. Um, okay. This is a curse on your marriage from God because you married your, your, uh, your brother's wife. Yes. Uh, and so, kind of having some John the Baptist, uh, Herod, exactly vibes yeah, yeah, going yeah. on here, yeah. And Henry uh, is an incredibly zealous Catholic, uh, hates Martin Luther till his dying day, and even wrote specific like treatises, yes, against Luther. Yes, the, in fact, when I taught this, I had them read the introduction to Henry the uh, uh defense of the seven sacraments. Uh, where he just trashes Luther over and over and over again <laughs> and despises Luther till his dying day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People think Twitter is nasty, and it is at points. It absolutely is. Yeah. But man, read some Reformation polemics. And then, oh, yeah. <laughs> there, I will say, like, uh, the Rest is History podcast did a, did a series on Martin Luther recently. Mm-hmm. And every episode, they just sort of like went down a rabbit trail where they talked about bathroom humor and oh, yeah. bathroom insults and all sorts of things. And that's, I think, putting it kindly. Yeah, um, very kindly. So uh, Henry VIII has this like moment of. I believe conscience, where he's just like, I've done the wrong thing. The Pope is wrong in this. The Pope is is done the wrong thing, which mm-hmm. you know in Catholic medieval theology really can't. Uh, and so he goes to the Pope and asks for a dissolved a dissolvement of this marriage. Okay, and so you think there was a genuine twinge of conscience here, not just a political. Uh, Desire to produce a male heir. It could be both and. It, I think it is both and, okay. but I do think that conscience element okay. is also there. All right. Um, and so uh, the Pope, not wanting to set up, not wanting to upset the Holy Roman Emperor, so, you know, kind of waffles mm-hmm. and kind of says, well, l- let me send out this cardinal to, to do, uh, to, to, to hear your case. And so they have the trial of Black Friars, is what it's called. Uh, and Henry's theory is the Pope is wrong. I should not have married Catherine. It was against the law. And this sort of old retired cardinal sort of makes his way uh, to London. They have this. Uh, and on his way there, the Pope pulls him aside. Hey, by the way, don't rule against Catherine. Just just don't do it. Mm-hmm. And so this cardinal's put in a very awkward yeah. situation. Um, I don't have his name here, but it's a very Italian guy. You know, uh, um, and and this whole thing is very dramatic. Like you could imagine, if if you know if the United States ever had very dramatic courtroom proceedings where you know people were doing press conferences afterward, that's what this is. Okay, was that was that a little too close to home? <laughs> let, um, we'll let the listeners decide. <laughs> um, so Catherine uh, makes the announcement at the trial of Blackfriars. Hey, listen, I actually never consummated the marriage with Arthur and therefore – I was never married to him. I was never married to him. Uh, And, you know, the the Spanish lawyers are there making this argument. Uh, Everybody's up in, you know, know, in uproar. Uh, And eventually this cardinal, realizing this is a no-win situation, 
says, you want to know what? It's summer. Everybody go to the country. Do your thing for the summer. We'll pick this back up in the fall, which is pretty common. And he hightails it out of London, <laughs> never to return. Yeah. And so uh, it's at this time uh, that in 1524, Henry passes the Royal Act of Supremacy or the English Act of Supremacy, basically saying uh, the Pope is no longer head of the Catholic Church, but the king is. The king of England is. And uh, – Just uh, in England. Just in England. Yeah. That's right. And uh, taxes no longer go to, the, go to the Catholic Church but go to England, go to the crown. Hmm. And his marriage is dissolved. OK. And that's really what this, what this act does. Yeah. Um, uh, sort of working in the background is uh, Thomas Cranmer sort of crafting this legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, also adds in that, that Mary is not a legitimate child uh, and refers to her as what a non-legitimate child is. Okay. I, I want to keep the explicit <clears throat> rating off the pod. Um, <laughs> And uh, during this time, Henry has a has a woman he's been seeing hmm. uh, named uh, Anne Boleyn. Okay, and uh, jury's out on whether this is a mistress or uh, simply an emotional affair that he's been having up until this point. Uh, you can decide, uh, but uh, he marries her. All right, wife number two. Wife number two. Uh, Anne Boleyn has three children. Only one lives, and it is uh, Elizabeth. Okay. Elizabeth lives, the child of Anne Boleyn. Um, it's possible that at some point she had a deformed male child along the way. Uh, however, we, you know, seen as a sign of sorcery, sort, sort of a thing in yeah. that day and age. Uh, and eventually Anne Boleyn is, uh, loses the favor of King Henry. This is where I think he loses conscience and just becomes strictly political. All right. However, I do think he's a romantic. Uh, and I'll get to the reason why All right. here in a minute. Uh, but he, he ultimately beheads Anne Boleyn. Hmm. Ultimately, just, just Tower of London, very yeah. classic, yeah. Uh, off with her head sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, 11 days following her execution, he marries Jane Seymour. Good old Jane. Jane Seymour. Uh, she gives him Henry the Sixth, or excuse me, Henry Edward the Sixth, uh, who eventually does become King of England, and we'll cover that, I believe, next week. Edward comes around eventually. Yes. Yes. Um, however, uh, she dies shortly after childbirth, and uh, quite frankly, we just don't know much about her. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe the English have a tradition that she was a great lover of dogs, but outside of that, we just don't know much <laughs> about right. Jane Seymour. But she does give birth to Edward uh, the Sixth. Finally, at least one male the, heir. There's a yeah. male heir. Yeah, and they are they are super pumped. Um, and it's important to remember that during the background, uh, in the background of all this, Henry the Eighth is removing all of his Catholic, uh, uh, all of his Catholic workers, all of his Catholic mm -hmm. uh, pe people that are advising him, all these things, and replacing them with Protestant Reformation people. Yep, Henry. I'm not convinced what ever wanted the Protestant Reformation in England. He really just wanted to be uh, Catholic without the Pope. Seems fair. Yeah. Well, well you know, who am I to judge? <laughs> um, I never had this much power my whole life. Uh, so following the death of Jane Seymour, uh, Thomas Cromwell uh, comes to him and goes, hey, there's a German princess. We, we would like you to marry her. Uh, and it is Anne of Cleves. And so Anne of Cleves shows up. Rolling the dice with another Anne. Yeah, a lot of Anne's, a lot of Catherine's. Yeah. Um, so Anne of Cleve, uh, Cleves shows up uh, as a German princess, does not speak English. Hmm. Uh, Henry does not like her. In fact, uh, I believe at one of their first meetings, Henry dressed up as um, – as a, oh my goodness, gifts, uh, takes from the rich, gifts to the poor. Robin Hood. Dresses up as Robin Hood and has other uh, individuals dress up as his merry men and scampers into the bedroom to try to entice. And this meant nothing to her. <laughs> and she's just, just sitting there and is very unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and he's unhappy that she's unhappy. Right. And so he's very upset. Uh, he's so upset that that he divorces her. He leaves her. Um, however, they she lived out her days in England uh, un, until her death, and in fact owns. Uh, the funds uh, – she started a number of parks throughout England. And hmm. so you can see a number of parks in England today that uh, uh, started with by the, by the donation of Anne of Cleves. You know? OK. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, he does kill Thomas Cromwell uh, for this. So Thomas Cromwell <laughs> is put to death because he made a bad recommendation for a wife to Henry VIII. Yikes. The 1500s were just a wild time. Yeah. Just a wild time. So following Anne of Cleves – he marries Catherine Howard. Uh, Catherine Howard's 19 and uh, Henry VIII's got to be in his 40s, maybe later at this time. Uh, he uh, He's also becoming quite obese hmm. uh, during these years and uh, and uh, it ha- has a number of ulcers that, that stink uh, ag- aggressively. Nice. Uh, and so he uh, – if you think of – I never want to speak of a woman this way. But if you think of Catherine Howard as like a, a, a midlife crisis okay. sort of a sense, this is his sports car, right? Okay. Uh, this is him marrying somebody he, he has no business marrying. Uh, and he's doing all sorts of things. He's going, he's going hunting. He's doing all these exercises in order to like put himself in shape in order to uh, make himself attractive to this woman. Okay. Uh, he's unable to do it. She cheats on him. He has her beheaded in the Tower of London. Um, and in fact, it's Thomas Cranmer who passes a note to him and says, hey, BT dubs, <laughs> she's cheating on you. <laughs> OK. And his, his, his final wife of, of, the, of the six wives of Henry VIII is Catherine Parr. And Catherine uh, is very, very Protestant and – shapes her relationship with Henry VIII to move him towards Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And this is the wife uh, that Henry VIII has when he dies. And so uh, she tries – she shapes England in a number of ways to make England more Protestant. Um, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, she's married four times, Catherine Parr. Uh, Three of her husbands die. Hmm. And I believe this is her third husband, Henry, Henry VIII. Isn't that wild? Uh, so, you know, this, there's a little bit of Black Widow ness to it. Yeah, them. I mean, this that that has all the makings of a Dateline episode right there. Yeah, and so uh, Henry leaves this wild legacy. He's you know married six times. I mean, there there is literally a Broadway, mu- not a Broadway musical because it didn't start on Broadway, a, a London musical called Six, uh, going through the six wives of Henry VIII. <laughs> like this is very famous history, right? Yeah, uh, he's a very zealous. Catholic, uh, desperately wants Catholicism without the Pope, really for his own gains. You think, you think though that 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 was the case all throughout his life that he never came around in any sense to Protestant convictions. I don't think so. Okay, I I I really think he's he wants Catholicism, but he wants control. All right. Um, and he does it for a mixture of reasons, like uh, he thinks the Pope is wrong in, mm-hmm. in this instance about his wife. Um, so very relig- very religious guy. Uh, he's a desperate romantic. He, he, he really wants the feelings of love um, in a lot of ways. And that's why he keeps divorcing these women. Uh, one of the re- – or chopping off their heads. I shouldn't say divorce. Um, Let's see. Uh, hated Martin Luther till his dying day. Had William Tyndale tracked down and killed. Um, however, uh, all the Catholic leadership in uh, his court got cleared out, all replaced with Protestants, and they really shaped the country in Protestant ways. Yeah. And as Edward takes the throne, which we'll talk about next week, he re- they really begin to shape things. They really come out of the closet a little bit. Uh, and begin to shape England in in really Protestant ways, in yeah. really aggressive, overt Protestant ways. Mm-hmm. And we'll leave it for there. There you go. There you go. Yeah, six wives. Wow. Could you imagine? No. No, I cannot. Time now for This Day in Sports History. This Day in Sports History, May 28th, 2024. 
Um, do you realize we're five months? By the time this drops, we'll be at the end of the fifth month getting ready on the on the cusp of going to the sixth month mm-hmm. of the year. Yeah. Halfway through. Summer's already over, John. Yeah. Just, just book it. Uh, 1955, Indianapolis 500, Bob uh, Swikert wins uh, defending champion Bill uh, Vukovic. Vukovic. Uh, Vukovic uh, killed in crash while seemingly on his way to an unprecedented third consecutive Indy 500. Man. Vukovic. Yeah. Anyway. 1960, 59th uh, men's French uh, championships, Nicolas uh, Petrangeli. I don't know if I'm getting that right. No. Uh, beats Louis Ilaya? <laughs> Ilaya? Ayala. There's like... Four, four <laughs> vowels and one consonant in there. Yes. I, I would go N- Nicola Pietrangeli. Yeah, what did I say? Be- beats Louise Ayala. That'd be, that'd be what I'd okay. go there. 1994. We're moving on. Uh, <laughs> twins, Dave Winfield passes Rod Carew in, uh, into the 15th spot on the hit list. Yeah. That's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2005 uh, Super Rugby Final, Christchurch. Oh, boy. Uh, Canterbury Crusaders claim their fifth title with a 35-25 win over uh, – is that New South Wales? That would be my guess, yeah. Uh, Waratahs? Sure. Uh, Dan Carter lands three conversions and two penalties for the winners. Uh, rising Poon Supergiant. Uh, that's a, that, uh, that's a, I think that's a – Leftover from last week's episode there. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're right. My bad. Okay. That's on me. Okay. Um, 2006, Barry Bonds hits a 715th career home run, passing Babe Ruth on the all-time MLB hit list. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2017, Indy 500, Japanese X Formula One driver, uh, Takuma Sata of Andretti. Uh, Auto Sports becomes first Asian to win the race. Brazilian uh, Helio uh, Castro Neves finishes just 0.2011 seconds behind. Yeah. There you go. All right. Who do you like? Well, that's a great question. Um, Question for you on the Super Rugby Finals. mm -hmm. Is that the collegiate I don't know. Because what was that tour? What what was that campus we toured in? It was Canterbury. It was Canterbury. That's what I thought. Yeah. They're in in Christchurch. I'm inclined to go Christchurch because I've been there. (laughs) Okay. Let's go Super Rugby Final. Okay. One thing you liked. Uh, I am going to recommend an English Reformation book that will give you all the details you want about King Henry and his wives. Okay. Okay. Heretics and Believers. Nice. It's about five to six hundred pages. So it's a it's a tome of a book. Okay. Heretics and Believers. Heretics and Believers. All right. Is that something you can kind of sounds like something you can kind of dip into though, right? Like oh yeah. I mean you like he does, read selections, not unless he does like 150 pages on medieval life um in England at that time. Okay. I might recommend skipping that, <laughs> uh, yeah, or or skim and get the main points. But the stuff yeah. about Blackfriars, Blackfriars trial, mm-hmm. wonderful. I mean, okay, getting into, I mean, I don't think I mentioned it, but Anne of Cleves was from Germany, right? Mm-hmm. She's a you know, Protestant, and so this is Thomas Cromwell trying to yeah. move the country. There you go. Anyway, what do you like? So uh, I'm going to stick with the theme of a book related to the Reformation. Nice. So I'm going to go with uh, Michael Reeves' book, The Unquenchable Flame, which great uh, book is great what, book is arguably my go-to book for the Reformation. Hmm. It's short. I mean, it's a total of is it even 200 pages? It's bare, like the actual text itself is. It looks like it's just under 200 pages. Nice, uh, readable. Doesn't bog you down in unnecessary detail, um, and does just a great job with that. Um, it was between that and uh, have you seen uh, Steve Nichols' book, uh, the uh, the monk and a Mal- monk and a mallet or something? I think no, that's his title. No, I don't think I've seen that. I that's like a, Steve though. That's another like 
very introductory overview of different parts of the Reformation. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Michael Reeves' The Unquenchable Flame. That is my one thing I liked. All right, John, we have talked Patrick Schreiner, The Transfiguration of Christ, Chapter 3. We will do Chapter 4 next episode. And uh, that's leading up to our eventual interview with Patrick on the show coming up on, in June. Yep. Uh, we have talked the English Reformation Part 2, and in particular, Henry VIII and his many wives. Yep, yep. He's got a lot. Yep. We have talked the Super Rugby Final in Christchurch. Go Canterbury. Amen. We have talked Heretics and Believers. Who is the author again? I can't remember. Okay. Uh, and then uh, The Unquenchable Flame by Michael Reeves. So I think by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say is, until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later. Later.